Good afternoon. My name is Charles Jennings. I'm director of the Christian Regenhard Center for Emergency Response Studies here at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And on behalf of um, our colleagues uh, at the Center on Terrorism uh, and uh, their co-director, Peter Romaniak, I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's event, which is on uh, political extremism in the public service and the public sector. Uh, needless to say, a very timely topic. Uh, before we uh, start with today's program, which is going to be moderated by Clark Kimmerer, who is a member of the Reagan Heart Center Advisory Board and also affiliated with the uh, Center for Homeland Defense and Security of the Naval Postgraduate School, um, I just wanted to reiterate that this is part of an ongoing series. And uh, if you go to our webpage, uh, you just click on events and you will see our upcoming events. Our next event is May 19th, and we'll be discussing the evolving threat environment for fire and EMS personnel. Uh, and uh, you can also join our mailing list uh, by clicking on contact and subsequently clicking join now, uh, which will connect you, uh, put you on our list serve. We also have an active Twitter feed uh, at RacersJJC. And so we encourage you to uh, uh, subscribe as well. So with that, uh, I want to uh, welcome you all and uh, turn it over to uh, our moderator uh, Clark Kimmerer. Thank you, Charles. Greetings to all. This is going to be a very interesting session today, and I appreciate all of your participation uh, in uh, hearing from our uh, experts, as well as asking you to engage with them uh, through the uh, Q&A feature in chat, uh, which I'll be monitoring in addition to posing my own questions. Uh, again, my name is Clark Kimmerer. Uh, I am on the advisory board of the Reagan Heart Center for Emergency Response Studies. Uh, as uh, Charles also mentioned, I am affiliated with the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. Uh, my opinions today do not reflect those of the center. Uh, I'm here principally to uh, be your moderator and uh, to key up questions of moment on a topic of great moment, the rise of political extremism and its impacts on public service and public safety. My career was with the Seattle Police Department. I had 31 years, uh, starting obviously as an officer. Uh, the 16 of the final 31 years, I was the second in command of the Seattle Police Department, alternately in roles uh, of either the chief of operations or the chief of staff. Uh, and so uh, with that, I wanna make a few opening comments before turning it over to uh, our distinguished panel of, uh, of professionals who've been thinking a lot about this, this issue in their careers. Um, I, I recall when I was in college that I volunteered uh, a number of times for the Red Cross. Um, and uh, the Red Cross guided by seven principles. I was frequently oriented and trained in those principles. And the very most important one of all that they stressed was the principle of neutrality. And in their doctrine, they describe neutrality as uh, in order to continue to enjoy the confidence of all, the Red Cross may not take sides in hostilities or engage at any time in controversies of a political, racial, religious, or ideological nature. That's always stuck with me. And it was a kind of a, a founding uh, doctrine to, that I brought into my public safety and public service career. Uh, in the law enforcement profession, there is a similar doctrine that is variously described as neutral competency. Now, my education as a police officer and commander and ultimately chief focused upon objectivity and impartiality, neutral competence. The rule of law and the protection of the public were my guideposts. But as I look out at the landscape today, at the politically polarizing and, pol and, and divisive nature of what's going on in our country, it's hard to find objectivity and neutrality and impartiality. Harder still to find civil discourse and ideological tolerance and generosity. So these vital principles seem to have been replaced by a rabid partisanship, intolerance of contrary opinions and the use of disinformation and conspiracy theories that are shouted at the highest volume. This is a crisis that cuts both ways. Attempts by the police, for example, to ensure public safety, enforce the laws, keep the peace, is often met with 
derision, distrust, disobedience, and sometimes outright violent resistance. But at the same time, some of our public servants, including the police, have replaced neutrality and objectivity with allegiance to political movements and ideologies, as was seen most dramatically on January 6th. You know, it's often asserted that the police, particularly uniformed police officers, are the most conspicuous representatives of government. Policing this current environment of radical partisanship presents challenges of historic proportions. But it also begs the question, what are the principles and values that the police conspicuously represent? This is one of the topics that we're gonna be diving into today. This divide that is under the rubric of what we call political extremism. And what are, what are the challenges that that presents, that reality presents, and maybe uh, hopefully we can identify some pathways forward. So it's my privilege to introduce uh, our panelists today. I'd like to start with uh, Don Hader Markell. He's a professor and chair of political science at the University of Kansas. His research and teaching is focused on the representation of group interests in politics and policy and the dynamics between public opinion, po political behavior, and public policy. He has more than 20 years of experience in survey research, interviews, and policy studies, and authored, co-authored several books, over 80 refereed articles, and more than a dozen book chapters on a range of issue areas, including civil rights, politics and the cultural wars, uh, criminal justice policy, counterterrorism, race and inequality, and environmental policy. Our other panelists today, Mike German, Michael German, fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice, Justice's Law, Liberty and National Security Problem and, and Program at NYU, which seeks to ensure that the US government respects human rights and fundamental freedoms in conducting the fight against terrorism. He's a former special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. His work focuses on law enforcement and intelligence oversight and reform. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, Mike was a, a policy counsel for national security and privacy for the American Civil Liberties Union, wa Union's Washington Legislative Office. Again, privileged to be in your company. Uh, as well as all of those who are participating in this program today. Uh, as questions arise, uh, as you're listening to the presentations, uh, please use the chat feature and I'll be checking that with regularity as well as posing some of my own questions. Like to start with uh, Don uh, to give some opening observations and reflection. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Um, thank you. I'm happy to be here today and thank all of you for putting this together and being agreeing to moderating. Um, I will say um, the information I'm providing is all public source information. I'm a civilian, so I don't have access to anything really particularly special. I also tend to put way too much information in my slides, so I apologize from the beginning. Um, but, I, but I hope to keep this relatively short. I just want to walk through a few, a few elements of my investigations and my understanding of what's currently going on and the potential threat of domestic extremism in public, uh, domestic extremism in public service at the federal level. So just for a little background on where we're at, um, you know, domestic terrorism, domestic um, violent extremism tends to go in waves and currently we're in a, in a basically a far right wave. Um, this shows um, in the past decade or so the, the number of deaths by um, terrorist incidents in the United States. Um, and we can see the growth has, of the far right has overtaken jihad, so-called jihadist terrorism in the United States. We can also look at that same, rel relatively same time period um, in terms of plots and actual attacks and see a similar pattern. Um, the top line here is represents the um, violent far right. And these are both plots, disrupted plots, as well as actual attacks. Um, and the sort of waveform I'm talking about, if you go back into the late 90s, early 2000s, you see a lot more far left um, extremism. As you move forward, it's more far right extremism. So thinking about um, public service and sort of attempts to disrupt some of this activity, um, as early as February of 2009, the FBI um, announced a new program to, in part at least, try to prevent violence by current and former um, armed force service members and their recruitment by far right groups. And the Obama administration also clearly recognized the potential problem. The Department of Homeland Security issued on a number of assessments 
all of which were withdrawn by September 2009 because of pushback by Republicans in Congress saying that this um, targeted far right groups. And of course, in the Trump administration, there's plenty, been plenty of evidence, including um, West whistleblower complaints that um, intelligence was being modified to satisfy the president's uh, assessment that left wing extreme, extremism was more important than right wing extremism. But if we look sort of historically, um, while there certainly is some uh, affinity towards left wing groups by those in the federal government, um, what we see with the armed forces in particular is a drift towards right wing extremism. And this isn't a new phenomena. So I'm just listing out some of the key characters in far right extremism history here. Um, folks like George Lincoln Rockwell, who started the American Nazi party, was an army veteran, all the way up to people like Tim McVeigh and Eric Rudolph from the 1990s as domestic terrorists in the United States. So you get the general idea um, about far right extremism and affiliations. Also recently, we've seen an uptick in actual um, plots and terrorist attacks by active duty or reserve service members. Um, and this graph, graphic demonstrates that. I wanna go into this in a little bit more detail here um, next, but I just wanted to show you that uptick such that in 2020, 6% um, of far right extremist attacks in the United States or plots or attacks were perpetrated by active duty or reserve um, service members. What we've seen here is this uptick to 6.4% up from 1.5 in 2019 and none in 2018. We also know that in 2020, the FBI said it was investigating 68 current or former members of, of the armed forces for domestic extremism. When we look at one six, the 1-6 one event in particular, we know that about 18 to 1,000 people fought with per police or breached the Capitol. Um, during the riot on 1-6. Right now we have about 357 people charged. And of those charged, about 12% were veterans um, or were currently serving compared to veterans and currently serving as about 7% of the general population. So disproportionately represented um, in the Capitol riot. We also know that the of the arrestees from the Capitol riot, um, veterans, were, or those with military experience, current or veterans, were four times more likely to be affiliated with an extremist group or network such as the Proud Boys or the Three Percenters. There are other recent examples of um, specific vi violence by um, current or former armed force members. Stephen Carrillo is probably the most notable, um, having killed two um, security or police officers um, his, in his attacks, and he was affiliated with what's called the Boogaloo Boys. Um, Paul Edward Beller had helped train the militia, who was an army vet, helped train the militia group in Michigan that plotted to um, kidnap the governor um, this past fall, and was all were arrested this past fall. And currently, according to um, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, um, it's estimated that about 25% of civilian militia, active civilian militia members are um, veterans. A couple of re relevant groups I just wanted to highlight real quick. We have, of course, uh, militias in the United States, so-called citizen militias in the United, United States from the 1990s. They kind of went away for a while in the early 2000s. And then we saw a resurgence under the Obama administration. But most notably, we've had several new uh, movements or organizations pop up on the scene, those being Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys, and the, and the Boogaloo Boys movement. Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters in particular have really focused on trying to recruit current armed force members or veterans. The Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys have done that as well, but really the Oath Keepers in particular really looking at recruiting former military or law enforcement in particular with their Oath Keeper name. A couple of symbols that I think people should be aware of. Um, there are many different representations of far right extremists in the US, but a big part of going forward will be recognizing who these groups are, 
and what the symbolism is that they use. Um, so some of the racist right symbolism that we see um, are things like from the Christian identity movement or things like this Roha, which is racial holy war. Of course, um, attribution of Nazi symbols and the like, but then also some newer phenomena that people may not be familiar with, like with the Boogaloo Boys wearing these Hawaiian shirts, um, utilizing memes from the racist right and using symbols like this igloo in the flag represented with a, a sort of a line of a Hawaiian shirt here as well are important symbols to be recognized that are just there. Some others like the three percenters always have the three, the three lines, the three Roman numerals in all of their regalia. The Proud Boys always use PB in some form um, in all of their representations. So those are just sort of examples to look for, but I think for the most part, folks have to get educated first about the symbolism of these groups to be able to identify who's affiliated with them and who's not. So just a couple of thoughts on what to do about this. I think it's really important that the Defense Department right now just ended their stand down on extremism. And there really seemed to be a desire for more information, including the commissioning of this um, study of the total force and, and setting up a, a standing working group on extremism. Uh, it's pretty clear from the initial memo from the Secretary of Defense that there really needs to be a clear definition of extremism. There needs to be better screening um, of recruits, especially using standardized questions and a plan of action of what to do if somebody is uncovered within the services. Um, one of the big things, however, I would sort of point to, which seems to get a little bit less attention is the exit training for those separating from the armed forces, especially those facing a dishonorable discharge and what the armed forces can do during those exit trainings um, that really might help alleviate the, the, the pressure of being recruited to these um, especially newer militia type groups on the far right. The last part is that I think these, the application of these ideas and rules should also be um, applied to federal government contractors and civilian enablers within the DOD. And that's what I have. Thank you, Don. Uh, we're gonna obviously have a lot more questions as, as the production goes on, but just a, a, a quick one for you. Uh, what do you believe are the principal impediments to implementing the recommendations and observations you provided in the, in the last slide? What's keeping this from happening? Uh, is it First Amendment issues? Is it, you know, uh, even the ability to create ways to discern political affiliation? Uh, what's, what's your view on what's keeping us from, from mm -hmm. closing this loop? So I, I think you can see it in lots of different forms, but the first, of course, the first part comes with the First Amendment. I mean, even just thinking about regular political speech by um, members of the armed forces or even any government employees at any level, um, that they still have a freedom of speech. Um, they still can attend political rallies. They still obviously can voice support for candidates. Um, and distinguishing that kind of political speech from affiliations with domestic extremist groups, I think becomes tri tricky. And even, even amongst government agencies or say between different academic communities, we oftentimes disagree on how we're defining things like domestic extremism, certainly how we define terrorism. The, the FBI doesn't even define terrorism the same way the Department of Homeland Security does as just one example. So I think definitions and also understanding um, where we can sort of um, be investigating the, the speech as well as the actions of individuals and not override people's rights. Great, thank you. We're gonna talk about this a lot more as, as we know. Uh, I'd like to uh, now ask Michael German to uh, give us his uh, opening observations. Thanks very much, Clark, and, and thanks to Charles and Peter for organizing this and Don for being a co-panelist. Um, I, I started uh, looking at this problem uh, uh, in a very different manner than most people. 
when I was asked by my superiors at the FBI to go undercover in white supremacist groups. So my interest in learning about these groups had, had more to do with how I can actually interact with them and uh, pretend to be one of them. And uh, I, I looked towards a lot of the, the existing academic literature and uh, asked the FBI for intelligence on the issues. But when I got in with these groups, what I realized is that much of that material is um, uh, influenced by an impression that we have in society or that we'd like to have that uh, white supremacist and far right militancy is this fringe ideology on the edge of our society uh, rather than foundational to our society, which is how they see it, right? What we don't really understand or, or, or acknowledge is that our nation was founded as a white supremacist project, right? European colonization of the quote unquote new world uh, it took over lands that were inhabited and, and engaged in genocides and uh, other you know, you know, chattel slavery. Uh, you know, these white supremacy was baked into the law. So when law enforcement developed it was developed to enforce those white supremacist laws. And it was that way for hundreds of years. Uh, so, it, you know, since the civil rights movement, we've moved away from white supremacy as law, uh, but that structural racism continues to influence law enforcement policy and practices. Um, and you know, that's apparent through any uh, measure. I, I worked at the FBI, which still remains more than 80% white and more than 80% male, right? So if you look at police departments across the country, they tend to be whiter than the communities that they police. Uh, you, and this isn't just a law enforcement issue, right? It's part of these white supremacy and that, that's structural racism and white supremacy affects every government institution. It's just as Clark said, the, the police department tends to be the most prominent government actors that people uh, interact with. So it, it's more visible when, uh, when we see involvement with these groups among law enforcement officials. When I was asked to go un undercover uh, in the early 1990s, uh, the case was worked through the Joint Terrorism Task Force, so hand in glove with, with uh, other federal, state, and local law enforcement. And we were all advised that we had to be particularly careful with this operation because there were white supremacist sympathizers within law enforcement. And that was generally understood uh, that that was true. In other words, there wasn't a lot of pushback from uh, the representatives from local law enforcement agencies that this wasn't really a problem that we had to concern ourselves with. Uh, so we were instructed to be very careful about who we shared information about the operation with. Um, after I left the FBI uh, in, in the 2000s, a 2006 uh, FBI document documenting the, the infiltration of, of law enforcement by white supremacists uh, was released through a FOIA request uh, that basically just reiterated the, the, the personal warnings I received uh, a decade before. In 2015, the FBI's counterterrorism policy guide made the case even more explicitly. Uh, it warned FBI agents working domestic terrorism cases against white supremacists and far-right militias uh, that the subjects of their terrorism investigations would likely have or, or often have uh, uh, active links, it used that language, active links to law enforcement. And it advised those agents that they had to modify their, the tactics that they used to try to protect the integrity of their investigations. Now, what's interesting about both of those documents is they focus on the threat white supremacists and far-right militants in law enforcement poses to FBI investigations. It did, neither document uh, discusses the threat 
white supremacist police officers pose to the communities that they police. And that's really the big uh, disconnect here that, that these officers pose a continuing threat to the, the communities that they police. And the FBI has jurisdiction through civil rights laws to address those crimes, but they tend not to, or they, they, they only tend to uh, look at the issue when it rises to public attention. So many times over, over the last several years, we've seen instances where perhaps during one of the, the racial justice protests, a police officer would be wearing one of the 3% militia patches that, uh, that Don mentioned on their uniform while they're policing a protest. Uh, and otherwise acting with some affinity towards these far right groups and allowing them to engage in public violence without taking enforcement actions. Um, and that would then raise the pub, uh, public scandal that the police department would have to address. But I wrote a report last summer called Hidden in Plain Sight, Racism, White Supremacy and Far Right Militancy in Law Enforcement. And what I looked at in those cases is that often the police officer's affiliation with these white supremacists or far right militant groups was was long standing they had the police department knew that they had participated in these organizations sometimes for years and didn't take action until the public discovered it and once it ro rose to the attention of a public scandal then they would take action uh, so when the January 6th attack on the Capitol happened and dozens of police officers, active police officers were among uh, the rioters, including several who, who have subsequently been arrested and charged with federal crimes at the riot, uh, not too many people should have been surprised, right? This has been a longstanding problem that's acknowledged even in law enforcement, and yet we don't have a national strategy to address it. And I think that's the, the big disconnect. But we have to recognize this isn't just a law enforcement problem. As Don mentioned, it's, it's, in the, it's a problem in the military. You know, and, and the January 6th event sort of wasn't a, a standalone. It, was, it didn't come from nowhere, right? And, and what we've seen over the last four years that has been different from decades past is that you had a president who was actively speaking to this audience. And I think this was part of the problem where you had, uh, as, as uh, Clark mentioned, a more polarized society, politically polarized society, where through our counterterrorism policies, which were very Islamophobic, we created spaces where law enforcement and the military would, would be interacting with white supremacists and far right militant groups, right? So they'd be on the same side of these political debates on issues of counterterrorism, on issues of crime prevention, on issues of uh, immigration enforcement. Uh, many of the, uh, the far right groups uh, after 9-11 didn't disappear, they just rebranded themselves as border militias. And that activity acting as an adjunct to border government border control operations, again, put these groups in the same kind of spaces on the same side of the political issues with law enforcement. And then in 2015, we had a candidate running for office, openly speaking to these groups and encouraging them. And at the same time, encouraging a violent reactionary police response to what he termed Antifa violence, right? This term that he made up. Now, you know, my law enforcement actions in, in the early 90s could have been described as anti-fascist, right? We were targeting uh, violent Nazi groups. Uh, I never thought anti-fascism would go out of style. Uh, but here we had a president who was, was labeling the, the racial justice protests, not as they did as Black Lives Matter protests, but as Antifa violence. And again, because these groups tended to protest police actions and law enforcement policies, 
the police saw themselves as antagonistic to these groups. So now you had them again on the same side as these white supremacists and far right militias. So I think that's why some of the, the interaction is much more public today than it has been. So, you know, now that this, it, this uh, phenomenon has been so well exposed and the threats that it posed uh, so well demonstrated, I'm hoping that the Justice Department will take the opportunity to actually develop a national strategy to address it so we can address the problem proactively rather than waiting for each public scandal to emerge as, as details uh, come out. Um, so I'm happy to take questions and uh, I'll leave it there. Great, there, great, thank you, thank you Mike. Uh, we got a number of good questions we're gonna get to. I just wanna start by uh, asking you, to, you know, may, maybe this is a theoretical question more than anything else, but uh, uh, you know, having managed a large police department, 19th largest city in the country, uh, it was an exercise of frustration to attempt to meet some of the very logical and, and rational uh, standards that you have you know, elucidated for us about you know, behaviors and, and things like that. And, and a lot of times we would fall back on this really tired sort of construct that, well, I can't change what's in your heart, but right. I, can I, can, I can moderate your behavior. I can demand certain behaviors. Is that even a viable sort of, of way to think about the world right now? Uh, I, I think it is, and I think that's the key to, to effective enforcement, is to focus on behaviors, right? Again, because we tend to treat this as this fringe problem rather than foundational, it, it, it was amazing when after the Capitol attack, there were allegations and videos that seemed to show police officers cooperating with the, the breach of the Capitol and, and allowing that to happen. And that there was shock and outrage that that could have been possible. But then very quickly, there was stories in the media about the numerous racial discrimination uh, uh, complaints that, that, that uh, officers of color had been making against the department for decades, right? And that, that's the thing where the police department doesn't have to you know, monitor the social media of, of every police officer and try to, as you said, delve into their hearts. They just have to look at their actions, right? If they just go down to the squad room and say, hey, who are the racist cops? The people who work with them know who they are, right? right? You're often making complaints about them that, that become these discrimination complaints. Moreover, the community certainly knows who they are. And, they can, and they're often making complaints as well. But those complaints sit in one pile for an administrator while they're over here looking for signs of, of extremism rather than recognizing that these things are connected. And if there's a police officer out there who has hardened racist beliefs, but they never show up in his behavior toward his fellow uh, uh, officers or his actions towards the community. He just goes home at the end of the day and, and thinks his racist thoughts in the privacy of his home. I don't worry about him. I worry about the guy who is engaging in racist behavior on a regular basis and not being punished for it. And part of the problem right now is a police officer reporting the racist misconduct of a colleague has more at risk to his career than the person who's engaging in racist misconduct. And that's what has to change. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're also in an environment, I think, as, as you both have been saying, I said at the beginning, that uh, is the like of which I don't think we've seen, at least not in, in this uh, dramatic way about intolerance and creating an environment of, you know, just just confrontation and not civic confrontation, you know, not what you would hope were, was happening in the academies and the universities, for example. Uh, and and uh, it doesn't it seem like an ideology that lies dormant when it finds the right environment could become outward manifest action taken on it. So I even worry about the person, you know, that, you know, has, has darkness in their heart, but doesn't, you know, behave and, and act 
on that? Isn't, isn't the environment ripe now for that latent or dormant sort of, of, of uh, ideological uh, uh, kind of dangerous set of thoughts to be made manifest? And, and if that's the case, do we not also have to think, you know, as a police department, for example, of, of your ideologies? It's a hard thing to find out about people, uh, particularly if they don't want you to know, but it's not impossible. And, and, and should we be thinking about, well, if you are, are you know, affiliated or in other ways, uh, you mentioned uh, that there's affiliations that are, have been known for a long time by many departments. Um, I mean, it, is, it, what, do you, what do we do with that that we aren't doing now? Uh, well, number one, I, I, I don't think that, that much of the misconduct is, is hidden. Uh, right. For example, there was a, a report where some journalists got a hold of uh, uh, some kind of internet chat room that Border Patrol officers were involved in where they were exchanging racist and misogynistic messages. It, it turned out the leaders of the Border Patrol were on that platform. So it's not like anybody was afraid that their leaders would find out that they're... That they, racist yeah. attitude. So, you know, there's plenty to focus on uh, that's actual behavior without having to go there yet. And if there's that kind of enforcement, the person who, who has darkness in their heart but hasn't acted now has an incentive to keep that in, in their own that's private uh, uh, in, environment. Um, it, but um, more to the point, again, we tend to look at this as something that, that waxes and wanes, where what waxes and wanes is our attention to it, right? These people typically target marginalized communities. And if you look at uh, the, the clearance rates for violent crimes, for example, targeting communities of color are, are much significantly lower than uh, if they're white victims. So these, these are, are crimes that the police aren't investigating. So it's easy for that to stay out of sight. We also call it different things, right? A white supremacist kills somebody. We might investigate that as domestic terrorism. We might investigate it as a civil rights investigation. We might just treat it as violent crime. We might, as, as I suggested, completely ignore it. So it, it sort of gets diluted into these different buckets that it's not clear what we're measuring when we come up with this data. Yeah, good, good point. Don, how, what's the analogy in the military to the creation of this environment? It seems like the military would be more able to, you know, create the, the uh, at least the fear and apprehension of acting out on, on uh, you know, bad heart uh, inclinations. But is, is that the case? I mean, is, is the, the, the dynamic that uh, Mike's describing uh, similar to the one you're finding in your research on uh, military? Um, Systems. Yeah, I mean, you start with a little different um, surface, though, on, in, the, in the sense that the, the, the armed forces, each branch is really the, are some of the most diverse organizations in the country. So you start with that foundation. Um, unlike law enforcement, this is a much more non-white population. Um, so there is that. The other part of it is, is th there are elements or what we refer to as sort of flavors of far right extremism that aren't explicitly racist. They may be implicitly racist, but they're not explicitly racist. So this, the kinds of racist speech or racist behavior that you might even be able to point to in law enforcement isn't necessarily apparent um, in the military, but with some, you know, some of the incidents we've seen, even you know, some of the most infamous like um, Timothy McVeigh um, people from his unit could tell you that he engaged in racist behavior. He started fights with non-white people because they were non-white, um, that he, that he sh demonstrated those elements and no one did anything about it. Um, but also in the military, you have similar problems in that the person reporting whatever deficiency or um, behavior um, feels tends to feel as though their career is as at risk to the same rate as the offender, if not more so. Um, you see the same thing, you know, the military, the problem the military has with sexual assault is very similar. 
You know, that this is a, these are similar phenomena. The people reporting are afraid to report um, in large part because they believe nothing will really be done and they will just simply be ostracized um, and really kind of ending their, their careers. Um, but I think in the military, and, it, and I'm not sure I would say this is entirely true for law enforcement, you see some of the elements, especially the way, you know, especially as law enforcement has become more militarized, the sort of warrior mentality that they have, especially in the Army and the Marines, that that mentality can be um, can be sort of pursued without any sort of white supremacist intent, right? Without a racist intent. And really what you see, especially in the citizen militia movement and the far right extremism um, that we have domestically is that you can see the groups like the Oath Keepers pursue this warrior mentality without specifically building that on a racist philosophy. Um, so identifying rate, some of the typical ways we look at you know, behaviors that are discriminatory based on race or ethnicity or even gender in the military may not reveal the extremist ideology that lies beneath, you know, so that those behaviors may not necessarily exist for all of those who follow extremist philosophies. Yes, yeah. Well, again, merit, so what, what Mike was talking about earlier, it's, it's how, do you, how do you assess if there is a, a nexus uh, between your actions and your ideologies? I could tell you, I was on the SWAT team at a fairly much younger and skinnier age than I am now. Uh, and almost the entirety of, of the team were uh, former Green Berets, Airborne Rangers, I mean, elite folks. And uh, I couldn't imagine a more decent uh, group of folks, group of people. Uh, I never saw anything that amounted to, you know, these, these um, you know, um, this viciousness that we see in, in the ideologues in so many places in the country. In fact, quite the contrary. I mean, it was their professionalism and their competency, their neutral competency, that was what they took the most pride in. Now, we know that there is a great nexus between the military and law enforcement, a little less now than there used to be, but there were periods of time in, in the police agencies around the country where 70% of the, the officers that were hired and, and deployed were had military backgrounds, uh, and and I, I, I guess I'm I'm going to be continuously looking to see where ideology, where it even can be measured, fits uh, with you know what needs to be done by way of the management of in in the case of what you're talking about, you know uh, military professionals, what Mike's talking about, largely law enforcement professionals. Um, let me go to the question. We've got some great questions here, and. Uh, um, uh, I think we're going to see th this theme recurring. Uh, this comes from Peter, uh, uh, who said that beyond the, beyond the military and law enforcement, uh, in, in your research, or, um, are there best practices among civilian public sector agencies, whether local, state, or federal, regarding how to manage political extremism in the workplace and how to avoid partisanship in the delivery of public services? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I think we're talking about, you know, the Microsofts and, uh, and maybe other uh, entities. I mentioned the Red Cross to open this up, you know, and, and believe me, that is an enforced doctrine. Now, we're volunteers. We're not unionized, but nevertheless, you know, neutrality and, and that sort of thing. I, I don't know if you've seen any, if you've got any, you want to comment, I'll go to Mike next. Um, so, again, I, I think it's important to, to recognize, you know, as we're talking about defining extremism, when, when members of, of Congress are openly uh, uh, endorsing these ideologies or these groups, it, can we really just call it extremists? When the president of the United States is openly sympathizing with these groups, is it extremists, right? You know, and again, that's how we have to understand this issue differently from other groups that we often talk about in this context, whether they're Al Qaeda and ISIS, you know, they don't have people running for office under their banners and getting elected to, to uh, in democratic governments, right? This is a very different kind of problem, and we have to understand it. Its influence is persistent in every aspect of uh, our society. So. 
you know, we often recognize what has become termed implicit bias. <clears throat> and uh, you know, some of that training can be very good, but one of the issues I, I talked about in my report is I quoted three different police instructors on implicit bias who said that they intentionally never mention explicit bias in their training to law enforcement because they're afraid that that would alienate the people they're trying to train. Where it, it's like there's a huge elephant in the room <laughs> that all the officers can see that are subjected to the training that the, the trainer knows exists, but we're not gonna discuss that as we discuss these unconscious levels of bias. And I don't, just don't think that's an effective way of, of addressing the elephant. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And of course, there are programs, in both the private and the public sector that I, I think you're probably right in remarking some of them really dance around the issue that needs to be you know, looked at square in the face uh, right. to have any value at all. But you know, you're also right in commenting that uh, there are a lot of places in, say, law enforcement where, you know, you dare not speak this name. Uh, and I don't understand. You know, I do understand why. I mean, I think that there's the potential for a lot of alienation, but also specific union action and grievances and all kinds of stuff. You know, uh, right. don't you have groups that are led by law enforcement leaders, you right. know, right. and and they're part of, of this move, anomalous movement. Don, any thoughts from you about, you know, what you've seen that, you know, is, is promising maybe, or, uh, you know, not, not necessarily within the areas that you've studied, but uh, in say the private sector even? I think the, the way the private sector has approached most of these issues is much the way that Michael is referring to it, which is basically um, through trainings on things like implicit bias, but also understanding that the be focusing on behaviors. Um, and, and again, I would say this being um, discrimination on the basis of race or ethnicity or gender, but, but it, just hearkening back to the uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault, because it points to a sort of um, element of my behavior, I'm acting on my behavior from a point of privilege and how I understand other people. And, and going after people for those behaviors is the way you sort of weed out extremists. You can't simply just identify this set of ideas as being extremists. If somebody holds those, then they're out of this organization. Um, but certainly um, identifying those behaviors. Now, private organizations, certainly because they, they have sort of moral codes of conduct typically um, that when you agree, especially for salary employees to work for an organization, they typically have some kind of opt-out sector so that, for example, if you were affiliated with a group like the Proud Boys, um, that they, that would be grounds for dismissal. Um, and those applications simply aren't going to apply for public service for the most part, um, especially when somebody can sort of say, I've ended my membership with them and that's it. But private sector isn't gonna wait for you to sort of change change what you've done in your private life. They're just gonna let you go. Right. Although there is a moment even for both the military and law enforcement where those kind of, of uh, criteria can be uh, applied, which is when we hire, yeah. right? I mean, that uh, that's a, it's a they're not represented typically uh, in the hiring process for the probationary period, and police departments have the discretion to select people based upon, you know, what might be viewed as more philosophical or or uh, you know kind of ideological sort of of reasons. I think once you're past probation, uh, for the most part. Uh, Yes, Mike, it's right. You're right. It's about behaviors uh, you know, of necessity. Uh, let's get this is a very, you know, this is a big question, uh, which uh, David Shapiro is asking us. What are the root causes of this, what we think is a, a substantial uptick in domestic extremism? Um, Don, you talked about how, well, it's made the shift from left to right, from jihadists really in terms of impacts to, you know, domestic terrorism. But uh, I think we're right in saying it's increased and it's continuing to increase. What do you think the root causes are of that? So, so the way we typically understand um, 
what we call radicalization to extremism. And, and Mike's, I'm sure, certainly got something to say about this, but we see it as both a contextual phenomenon, what's happening um, in, society, in a given society, as well as individual characteristics. Um, and we can look to both those to sort of try to make predictions, but it turns out we're not very good at predicting it. Um, one of the reasons I highlight the sort of cycles, and, and certainly I understand the differences in reporting and where we're where we're understanding and defining certain incidents as, for example, terrorism or not terrorism, or do I call that a hate crime, um, or do I call that uh, domestic right-wing terrorism? Um, those kinds of things create may create patterns in the data that aren't really there, but I don't think it's really an, an accident to say, look, militias took different forms, for example, after the 1990s, and I think that's very much true but it took the election of our first African-American president really to get the far right coalesced um, most broadly in the Tea Party movement. Um, but as you see with most extremist elements, they splinter off some broader movement that's happening. And that splintering can occur um, even more so so that some of those groups will actually become violent. So if the, you can understand, for example, the Tea Party, Tea Party arising in context of the Obama administration, um, that sort of radicalization of the right sort of also inspired the creation of the three percenters of the Oath Keepers, et cetera, um, th those sort of newfound militias. So I look to that kind of context. On the individual level, you typically see individuals looking for some kind of finding a way to find a meaning. And the best way to do that is you can, if you can typically tie your own personal grievances to some ideological grievances that a group or a movement has. If I can see my position, for example, as a white male, um, or, or my position, like if I go through a financial crisis or my girlfriend leaves me or my wife leaves me or whatever, that situation as a white male in the society and some groups out here telling me white males are under threat and being problematized in the society, I can connect those two things and say, hey, they have answers to my problems. So uh, Mike, uh, uh, your thoughts about, you know, the, the growth and origins here of, of this crisis we're in. Uh, so I, I, I think if you, if you look at studies of uh, authoritarianism, that that presents a better picture of what's happening, that, that what we had that was different from the 1990s when I was with the groups, the people I was with who were engaging in bombings, who were manufacturing illegal weapons and trafficking in illegal weapons, they didn't go to public rallies. They understood that their activities were criminal and that they were the subject of law enforcement attention. And they weren't gonna show up somewhere where law enforcement could identify them uh, and associate them with the movement. Um, but over the, the term of the Trump administration, these groups were allowed to engage in public violence at these rallies. And the police did not take action to address it. And they began traveling around the country, raising uh, money to, to fund the fighters to travel around the country without any FBI intervention. And that encouraged a much more violent element to show up, right? And, and if you look at authoritarianism, that's how, how authoritarians gain power, right? They, they sanction this violent political force of thugs that work hand in glove with the police uh, to attack the, the authoritarian's political enemies and, and, and to create unrest in the street that the public wants to suppress and gives the government significantly greater powers to suppress, right? So it's a way authoritarians get, it, get control of a government. This is an old methodology. It's been around forever. I don't think it's something that anybody has to plan out. It kind of occurs naturally uh, because that's how... how, how human beings behave. Uh, so I think that's a lot of it is that these groups were allowed to engage in public violence and, and associated themselves with righteous violence against the political enemies of the president. I have a number of really uh, great questions from uh, Hassan Arslan. Uh, I'll pick one, there's about three or four that we may even get to if time allows. Uh, do the police unions have any political influence 
uh, power on the chiefs not terminating an officer with very well-known racist tendencies. I think broadly do police unions have a lot of power. Uh, and what does that power manifest in? And, and quite frankly, why, why is it? Uh, and and uh, you know, maybe what, what their justification is for that role, so. Uh, so I, I believe police unions play an important role in making sure that the management treats officers fairly and, and provides the due process that, that's necessary to justify any kind of disciplinary action. I think what's troubling is how they've become political entities outside of their role in defending officers who've been uh, uh, charged with a, misconduct rightly or wrongly and and that's created significant problems uh it, it, you know again it it's it's the enforcement of miscon misconduct allegations you know when uh, you have police officers who have or the police department receives complaints about racist misconduct by police officers uh, you know and and Minneapolis, I understand uh, the, the primary officer there had had previous complaints about racial misconduct and, and brutality. Uh, and he was a training agent, right? He was, the, he was picked to be a training officer, you know, that, that that aggression against the community is seen as a valuable asset that's rewarded rather than recognizing that's what needs to be addressed. And, and, and so, you know, it's easy for management to blame the unions in many cases. And I'm not saying the unions aren't part of the problem, but I think that that's not the only problem. It's yeah. management not, not having the willing. You know, it's always fascinating to me because when you look at these cases, you'll see that the police department found out about this person's behavior and they didn't take any disciplinary action because they were concerned with how the union would react, how, how the rank and file would react. But as soon as the public finds out, they fire them. Now, nothing changed about that officer's right. behavior. So if they had the power to fire him after it became public, they had the power to fire him before it became public. Right. I find that to be kind of cynical, self-serving uh, as an approach. And let me, I mean, let me tell you with all candor, I mean, I was in a, in a police department that was a great police department. Uh, and, and I still think that. I think they're under siege right now. But the kind of behaviors that you know we're talking about today and the kind of dynamic say with the union uh we we fought tooth and claw to make sure that our officers maintain integrity and that neutral competency and yes there are always going to be i'm afraid uh the the folks that you know don't get the memo uh but it was a fight every day and there were those moments i would venture to say in all honesty where a strategic decision was made about, you know, particularly on advice of counsel, and we always had advice of counsel, um, uh, that you're not going to win. You're not going to prevail in the disciplinary action you want to take against, you know, somebody that really needs to be disciplined or terminated or that kind of thing. Right. And, and you know, one of the recommendations I made in my report is, is for mitigation strategies. You know, okay, you found out this person went to a Klan rally uh, and participated in the events, perhaps you can't fire them. They were off duty or before, or it was before they became a police officer, but you can mitigate the problem, right? There are plenty of jobs on the police department that don't involve interactions with the public. And, right. and, and there are supervisory uh, 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 structures that can be developed to make sure that when that person does interact with the public, they're being watched and, and monitored and any, uh, misconduct they engage in is discovered early and then you can take further disciplinary action. There, there are many ways to have a mitigation plan, but too often what we see is, oh, we don't think we can fire them. We're going to imagine that the problem never existed. Good point. Uh, Don, I, I want to read you uh, this comment and question from Tyler Brockington. It's uh, going to expand upon what you have already been uh, sharing with us. Quote, this conversation has reminded me of the relatively recent news of multiple murders of at least 12 soldiers of color, particularly Latino, I believe, at Fort Hood in Texas. It was mentioned earlier that the racism is, that racism is embedded in our institutions from the beginning of our nation's history. 
Do you all have any suggestions on structural changes to our law enforcement and military institution to address this structural racism? I, which again, I think you've been attempting to, to share with us and, and maybe some additional thoughts from you on, on when you look at the Fort Hood uh, tragedy, for example. Well, you can start by renaming some of these bases. So, some of these forts, you know, naming them after Confederate soldiers tell, tells you the DNA of this place is based on um, a white supremacist ideal, you know, so that's a non-trivial thing to me. Like you really mm -hmm. have to rethink the ways in which we sort of honor and represent the past um, and, the, and the ways that we we educate those who are interacting in those in those with those historical markers about the past. So I think that's first and foremost. I mean, the, the military has done a, a generally a good job of having, of integrating a diverse, um, diverse workforce. You know, it's hard to point to other organizations that are necessarily better at it. Um, but I think some of the things like, um, even in the way um, promotions still work, even in the way um, lots of things that work, there are ways you can make those processes um, colorblind and gender blind that, um, that the military hasn't taken advantage of. Um, but just the fact that, you know, even the recent debate about the delay of some promotion of, of, of a couple of women to the position of general was delayed in the Trump administration because it was worried there'd be pushback from, from Trump. So they waited until um, till Biden came in to, to make those announcements. Um, those kinds of things, but just the fact that most of those people making those decisions are still white men is a problem. So there's, there's a way that, that if that force isn't diversified more quickly or that process isn't made colorblind and genderblind in some way, that these, these problems will continue to persist. You know, it's much, I, I make it akin to sort of the, the NFL owners who don't want to hire the black coaches because they don't quite um, they don't quite fit with our program kind of thing um, that that that's a representation of it um, in much the same way and and there there aren't easy solutions until you sort of get more diversity you won't get more diversity. Good point. Yeah, Mike. Anything to add to that? I mean, the, the structures of structural racism. I mean, where. We've already talked about, you know, some of them. I, I think, for example, the uh, the uh, employment, the hiring process, is a great, great starting point. But what else do you uh, think needs to be toppled, like uh, like more uh, the the tribute to uh, General Hood? Uh, I, I, I mean, there's there's a lot we can do as a society, right? I mean, it, particularly in the criminal justice system, we see racial disparities in every aspect of, of the system from who gets stopped to who gets searched to who gets arrested uh, to how they get charged to how long they get sentenced. We see these disparities. And these have existed since I went into law enforcement in the late eighties. And we acknowledge them, <clears throat> we document them, but nobody is really taking any kind of comprehensive approach to actually change the system. Uh, and instead, we just keep doubling down. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, you know, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was an inveterate racist uh, who, who uh, didn't want women or, or black agents among the, his special agent cadre. Uh, and every director since then has rhetorically said diversifying the FBI is a critical mission to make sure that it looks like the population uh, that we're responsible for protecting. Uh, and yet, somehow they never managed to do it. Now, there are plenty of, of very effective, trained, experienced uh, black and brown federal law enforcement officers in myriad agencies across the federal government who could be given an FBI badge tomorrow to diversify the FBI. It's not that hard. You just have to hire them. And, and, and it's interesting that Christopher Ray, the director of the FBI, was asked this question at a recent hearing, and he bragged about the diversity of the applicant pool. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, you're missing the point here. We know the applicant pool is diverse. The problem is the people who get through the application process are not. 
So until they change those processes, they're not going to actually create a diverse workforce. And then they have to change the way they treat those agents when they're on duty, uh, because what we see is a lot of, of them leaving the government uh, because of the way they're treated. And of course, discrimination complaints are, are persistent within the FBI as well. Let's follow up with uh, some of the things we've talked about before. Mike, Mark Chubb uh, has uh, posed this uh, really thought-provoking question. Uh, so to Michael's point that our focus on extremism overlooks how mainstream these ideologies are within our society and law enforcement agencies. Uh, he used to conduct leadership training with mid-career senior law enforcement managers. And part of this training involves a values assessment. Uh, he mentioned that he was stunned to find that justice, the word concept, the commitment and doctrine of justice, never appeared among the list of values central to their self-image. They were, however, very concerned about integrity, consistency of word and action, and loyalty. How do we make justice more central to policing? Why don't you take that first, Mike? And, and um, justice generally, how, how to make it more. Uh, I think it had, it's, it's about leadership. It has to come from the top and, and there has to be a reckoning with these ideas. I, one of the things that, you know, when, when I wrote this report to, to come out, I, I was expecting a lot of pushback from law enforcement. And this was before the, the January 6th attack when, when the involvement of, of police officers in this militant uh, movement became so obvious. Uh, but I received very little. You know, again, this is something that's recognized. Nobody is saying it doesn't exist. There's just not the political will to actually set up systems that, that address it. And, and one of the things key to what Don said about how they do it in the military, you know, I was around in the late 90s when some uh, Fort, Fort Bragg troopers killed a black couple trying to get their uh, bona fides as, as white supremacist skinheads. And there was a very similar sort of attention to the issue, but it was very short lived. And very quickly, we went right back to pretending this, this isn't a problem anymore. And we have to recognize that this is a problem in our society. So it's not, this isn't a six month project. It isn't a, a year long project. It isn't a 10 year project. This is something we are going to have to address continually in every aspect of our society. Uh, and, for the for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Don, let me uh, uh, build on that with a question from uh, Charles. Uh, do you have any thoughts about constitutional oaths, uh, the need to educate and make new government employees, for that matter, military employees, accountable for supporting and defending the Constitution? Wow, uh, that's, that's a real irony to me at, at this certain point, because, you know, especially in thinking about far right groups, the irony to me has always been a core tenant in on far right extremism in the United States has been, they are very anti-government, <laughs> but pro-constitution. So <laughs> yeah, figure so that one out. Yeah. Hard, it's very hard to, to sort of, um, to, to, have a sort of constitutional oath where you're talking about protecting the constitution and have people see that, but you're also saying you're protecting the government, that they, seeing the, the constitution as the and the government is intertwined. For some reason on the far right, they see those things as separate, um, especially if the people in the government are people they don't like. Um, you know, the, the unique moment of the Trump era was really seeing all these far right groups become pro government, essentially, at least they were pro Trump. Right. So they were still um, obviously opposed to Congress um, and such. But that that's the sort of irony of it is is just looking to the Constitution as a way to sort of unify people's perspective or have that be the civic religion. Um, doesn't really quite work. I mean, the, the Oath Keepers themselves are a great example. They are literally retaking the oath that, they're taking the oath that most law enforcement and, and military personnel take. They are taking an oath to protect the constitution, but they somehow see that as different from the government that's outlined in that same constitution. 
Interesting. I think and, behind, and, you know, yeah. Just add to that because I think he's making a great point and it, it demonstrates how, because their vision of the constitution is that it protects their rights in a way that overrides other people's rights, which was basically how white Americans felt prior to the civil rights era, right? That the constitution protects us and our communities from you, communities of color who are seeking equal justice and, and civil rights, you know, and, and that the purpose of law enforcement is to protect our communities from those communities. And, right. you know, that's why I think our counterterrorism approach sort of mainstream some of this thinking where, you know, it was very anti-Muslim in, in the bias and treated um, Americans, if they were Muslim, as suspected fifth column uh, uh, supporting enemies of the United States and law enforcement was there to protect us from them, even though we're, we're part of the same American uh, society. Right, right. You know, I, th I think uh, about the, 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 the crux of that question to me was, uh, you know, do we have uh, occasion to, or should we find occasion to enforce the taking of an oath? Uh, by that, I mean, you have sworn to do, now again, we're, we're, you're both saying, well, the oaths can be translated by whatever the ideology, you know, is, not that that's valid or, or uh, reasonable, but uh, if you're taking an oath, say to uphold the constitution and you are engaging in acts that are contrary to that oath, well, do you find evidence of any kind of enforcement of that? Just like, you know, do we find uh, occasions where uh, say a police department uh, brings up someone because they failed to do the right thing or because they avoided an obligation? It happens, but it's pretty rare. Uh, similarly, there are very a lot of policies that say if you fail to report the misconduct of another uh, officer. That is a, a chargeable or, or investigatable uh, offense. But is it happening? I mean, it seems to me that the, the written word is, is out there in many different forms, but there also seems to be a failure to actually act on, on those requirements. Is that fair to say? Or? I think, I think it definitely is fair to say that there's a failure to act, but it's also a tricky situation. So even with an example, you might say of a, a, a member of the military or even a law enforcement officer that has, an, um, has links in the past or currently to a group. And, then, and then, then I have to say, is that a group that actually has broken the law? So, <clears throat> so whether or not it's a racist group or not, has, is it a group that actually has broken the law um, and can it be labeled as such? So that essentially you're affiliating with a group that exists in part to engage in illegal activity and therefore you violated your oath. Um, you know, the difficulty I think is oftentimes in um, trying, to, trying to, trying to just being able to label these groups as actually illegal, whereas like if, if, the, if we had a law enforcement officer that had um, an affiliation with a, a criminal gang like the Crips or something, there's no question uh, how that would be treated, you know, but because these groups are political groups or have a political ideology, it becomes trickier to sort of say whether or not you're infringing on somebody's First Amendment rights um, and, and freedom of association versus whether or not they have violated their oath by associating with a criminal organization. Mm -hmm. it, it, and I, I think Don's exactly right. And mm -hmm. particularly because, you know, these, these groups have been around for a long time, right? They, they've learned the lessons, they've, they've morphed and adapted to what uh, impediments are put up to, to uh, uh, target them. So, you know, one of the things that they do regularly is, is change their names and, and mask their ide ideologies. <laughs> Uh, right. You know, if, if five years ago somebody found out that there were a group of proud boys in, in uh, law enforcement agencies, that would have zero meaning. Right? Nobody had ever heard of the Proud Boys. There wasn't right. such an organization. And when it was created, it was, you know, it hasn't, you know, its members hadn't committed 
uh, serious acts of violence right away. So how do we uh, manage that type of situation with, with a group that, that changes its names? And especially keeping in mind many of these groups, it's really only a handful of them that are engaging in violence or criminality. So, you know, at, at, at what point do you label the entire group responsible for the bad conduct of individual members? Right. So I'm not at all suggesting any of this is easy or, right. or there is some template that we can put down and address it. Uh, it's just that when problems are, are identified and raised to management, they have to take them seriously and set up mitigation strategies. OK, you know, this person is part of this group that's engaging in some questionable activity, but I can't really say that they're, you know, that just association with the group is a problem. But. I'm going to watch that guy and, and make sure that as they're interacting with the public, they're doing so in a respectful and appropriate manner. Right. I, you know, this is probably maybe a bit romantic to think about, uh, or at least a fashion as a question, but, you know, it seems to me that uh, there should be more pride in the organizations that we're part of. I mean, if, for example, and this is very true of the military and law enforcement, but really most walks of life, the, the medical profession, legal profession, you know, if, if you take immense pride in, you know, being a police officer, then would it not follow that you would not be one to tolerate the, you know, injustice or, or uh, misconduct of a fellow officer or, or colleague in the military or what have you? And yet, that seems to be one of the several questions we received seems to be one of the biggest questions. Well, why is it that there seems to be this, this reluctance uh, to, you know, you know, basically address, confront and, and, and validate the good works of, of your department by just being honest about what you're seeing. Yeah, you know, I, I thought the question about uh, police values that, that, uh, prioritized loyalty over justice uh, identifies part of the problem, right? That these agencies are more interested in, in protecting themselves than in protecting the public in many cases, in too many cases. Um, I think it's, it's a harder problem in the military uh, because Nazis make good soldiers, right? That authoritarian mindset is very helpful to a military unit um, and there is, you know, a, a military culture that looks at the German Nazi uh, military as, as pr pretty effective and, and models that we should follow that bleed over into uh, how, how we're addressing this problem. And as police departments become militarized, they adopt some of that culture as well. And that very aggressive, uh, single-minded, determined police officer is seen as the model rather than somebody who presents a risk, not just to the community, but to the police department. Because one of the things that, I, that frustrates me to no end about law enforcement affinity for these groups is that they kill police officers. This, this is a, something that, that's not just historical, you know, as, as Don pointed out last year, uh, at, at the Boogaloo boys killed police officers. You know, why, how, how would a police officer feel like associating or affiliating with these groups is somehow good for the police department is beyond me. Don, yeah. uh, the only things I'd add to that just real quick are uh, on one level with, as with any organization, I mean, there's always some people within it that feel like, this organization could represent the things I want to do more. And if there's an alternative to that, I might pursue it. Um, the other part is the law enforcement and the military in particular are fundamentally just targets for these groups. They are actively consistently trying to recruit both um, active members and former members of law enforcement in the military. It's just, it's, it's not as though they're, they're, they're out there trying to recruit people like me. They're, they're focused on these people that already have training, that already have a set mentality of how to sort of pursue their goals. You know, they're essentially getting uh, 
um, what any organization wants. I have a ready educated and trained person here that can do X number of different things and may even have incredibly specialized knowledge um, for violent activity. You know, it's just that they're, they are part of the overrepresentation you see is a function of recruitment and not just a function of the appeal of these groups to this particular subpopulation. Right. We, we haven't really talked about this yet and uh, we're going to be moving toward a, a summary here. Uh, but, you know, just as uh, say military and law enforcement are targets of these ideological uh, groups, they're also targets of everybody else, you know, and, and I, I don't think we should discount the, uh, the fact that, you know, so many of our public servants and, and, and military uh, professionals uh, are feeling alienation. They're feeling detachment from the society that they serve because they are going to be, you know, subjected to uh, media assaults and public assaults, many of them unfair. We're talking, all the folks we've been talking about today, I think, uh, are in a sliver, uh, maybe significant, but they're, they're not representative of the majority of the professionals in law enforcement and the military. Uh, and yet it's a universal kind of uh, challenge to keep a good spirit in light of, you know, how much derision is directed at, at uh, our public safety and, and public service folks. And I, I think when it when you, you are alienated, it's much easier to find a different path and different ideology from that which really represents the, the necessary mainstream. Um, that's my little sermonette, but uh, I've sure enjoyed this. Let's uh, take a few minutes, each of you, to give some summary comments and overview about this uh, session. Wish we could get more to, to more questions, but like everything in life, we uh, we have a clock governing what we do. Uh, great questions and really appreciate uh, the input from our participants. But uh, Mike, why don't you start and uh, give us your, your headline assessment of uh, this session today? Uh, you know, I, I think the point you just made is really important that we have to understand and acknowledge how much this is a, is a whole of society problem so that we're not just blaming the, the police officers and the police departments and uh, treating them separately from the rest of our government institutions uh, in, in addressing it, because there was a good question in the chat about, you know, how much does a crackdown reinforce the, the narrative of victimization that fuels a lot of these movements? And, and it is an issue. And I think what cures it is, is transparency and due process, right? That we don't wanna see uh, people, you know, the, the police departments and, and, and military doing what the military did in the 1990s was, you know, identify 20 white supremacists and fire them summarily and move on rather than realizing that this is a persistent problem that needs to be dealt with in a more sophisticated manner. Uh, uh, and it's something that our elected representatives uh, need to address more forthrightly. And, and that's where I think the missing part is because there's a, a number of politicians who use this friction uh, to gain political power. And you know, that's an age old problem uh, that, uh, that we, we just have to be willing to call out and, and uh, accept as uh, problematic to our society yes, yeah. or identify well, as problematic. It's been said that one of the most dangerous things you can do as a person is get between an elected official and a camera. Right. Uh, so that, uh, <laughs> Don, you have the last word. Yeah, I, I, I'm at least hopeful in the sense that we can begin to see these things as um, at, at as Mike was pointing out, as part of broader societal problems, that we that we when we have conversations about police and police reform, um, whether it be about this or uh, more broadly the way um, police are allowed to use force, et cetera, that that comes in the context of understanding uh, more broadly what do we want our government organizations to do, what do we expect public servants to do 
in our communities so that we, rather than have a conversation about defunding the police, we could have a conversation of, are we asking the police to do too much, um, for example? Um, and the same thing with the military. I think this conversation about extremism and the military and recruitment of military members to these groups needs to take place in thinking about what we've done for the last 20 years to our military. I mean, we've elevated them so that there's more confidence in the military as an institution than any other institution in American society. And that has slipped in recent months. Um, but nevertheless, we don't really in any way demonstrate that confidence by um, understanding the, the sacrifice that's been made over the past 20 years um, in this sort of global war on extremism that we've, that we've fought um, and really sort of figuring out how it is that we make these demands on our military, but also acknowledge, seriously acknowledge, and not just a thank you for your service when I see you in an airport kind of comment, but really acknowledge as a society what, what they've done. Thank you so much. That's very profound thoughts. And hey, it's been a privilege uh, talking with the two of you and hearing from our uh, participants uh, with their outstanding questions. Uh, we hope that this has been valuable. And, and uh, on behalf of the uh, Regenhardt Center for Emergency Response Studies and the Center on Terrorism at John Jay College, uh, thank you all. And the conversation will continue.